Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spinning Venom, aka the Venom Blog. This is episode 144, and I was just about to go to bed, but then I just couldn't sleep. And I actually saw that uh, you guys have really knocked it out of the park by uh, helping me get views on the reaction trailer, or the trailer reaction, which was super awesome. Obviously, as always, thank you guys. And I will definitely make a video like I did the last trailer, where I go through and I read some of your comments about what you thought of the trailer, and we will make a video about that probably in the next couple days. I'll probably put it up on Wednesday. Uh, so that'll be, that's my next day off of work, and I got a busy day tomorrow. So I figured I would knock this episode out real quick. We're going to do the shot-by-shot -shot, uh, breakdown. We're going to go through this trailer, uh, with, not with a super fine-tooth comb. There's going to be some things that I actually know what I'm looking at that I can't say, uh, and there's going to be things like that that happens. And there's things that I had just have maybe really, I think I have a really good educated guess, and I don't want to go into it just in case I'm right. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to go through and take a look at some of the images here. So we'll start with this first one here, which is the crash site or the you know location where they find the symbiotes. And there's I've seen a lot of speculation online, whether it's an actual alien spacecraft or if it's a human spacecraft that crashes and they find the tubes in there that uh, contains some of the symbiotes. And it makes me wonder if maybe some of those symbiotes got out because the one thing we always talk about is that this movie is based on Lethal Protector, but very few uh, will focus on the Planet of the Symbiote side. And in Planet of the Symbiotes, there was a location like this outside of New York, although the movie takes place in San Francisco, like Lethal Protector, but outside of New York in Planet of the Symbiote, there was this wooded area and there were symbiotes that were going around grabbing earth technology and bringing them back to the woods and building a uh, like a teleporter that could teleport more symbiotes to earth for a full scale invasion. So it makes me wonder if maybe this is kind of what's going on here. Uh, maybe there is a ship that, you know, uh, from either Life Foundation or, or the government or someone that got it. some of these uh, symbiotes, brought them here. And ever since the symbiotes landed, maybe a couple of them get away at the beginning and start plotting, oh, you know, uh, an invasion to get back at the people who took them from wherever they were. So I don't know, just a lot of speculation there. Um, that one, I, I don't think I'm right on. So that's why I don't, you know, don't mind sharing it with you guys, because I want to see what you think about that theory. Uh, but yeah, you get a little bit more uh, look at the structure here in the second photo. And then in the third photo uh, right here, you'll see that they're lowering the tubes in there, and that's like this, this, the tubes with the symbiote. And I see some red on the tubes, and I don't know if that's like chunks of flesh or, you know, or what that is, or if it's just, you know, just bad lighting or something, or, you know, they still got to color correct it or something. I don't know, but it, it looks pretty neat and uh, definitely looks like a transport unit. And I believe that's pretty similar to what uh, we see the symbiotes in later, just smaller versions later on, uh, because you'll see them get put right here in the fourth image into these cases and carried off by people in hazmat suits. Uh, so yeah, and then there are some things like, you know, the IMDB, we know there are people in hazmat suits, we know there's people uh, that are, you know, cast as restaurant people, uh, there's trolley people, obviously that's very San Francisco, uh, there's also a bar and a strip club, so even though we see Anne and uh, Eddie talking later on in a, in a restaurant, that's just one location. That's that's not where Jack the bartender is, and that's not where some of these other characters are, and we'll talk about them briefly. Uh, we have a shot here of the cars, uh, you know, going through, driving through the rain, leaving the site probably, and uh, bringing back the uh, specimens that they find. And then here we get a shot on the next image, uh, we get a shot of the symbiotes. And it looks like uh, uh, image six here has a symbiote in the front, and then there's the one in the back. We saw this before, but last time I don't think there was a symbiote in the first jar in the first trailer. I don't think they finished the uh, the the special uh, the visual effects on that yet. So it looks like we got it here, and it has a little bit of a blue tint to it. And I don't know if that's the lighting of the room because it looks kind of cobalty in the back of this truck. Uh, but the next symbiote is definitely more black. It, it looks a little bit be uh, better lit when the door opens up. So in the next image, uh, you know, image seven here, we see another shot of it, and then in image uh, eight here we get Riz Ahmed uh, with uh, that next to him on if you're looking right at him to his left the African-American lady is Shope Aluko she was the uh, actress from Black Panther and so this is that's her shot there I think that's Jenny Slate to the right and then the other guy there uh, is Wayne Perry I believe and he's playing Dr. Emerson at least that's how he's credited on the um, on the IMDb, so it makes me wonder if maybe Sope is actually uh, Shope is actually playing uh, uh, Professor Collins or Doctor Collins, because uh, I heard both of those characters were supposed to be in the movie, and those are really deep cut references because each of them have only been mentioned on one page uh, in the comic books. I think uh, Collins was in uh, Amazing Spider-Man three fifty two, and uh, and then. Um, 
uh, Emerson was uh, mentioned in one line in Lethal Protector number four. So yeah, uh, this one I thought tells a lot. This is uh, Image 9 in association with Marvel. To me, this shows clearly that this is separated from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I feel like this is their subtle way and not so subtle way at the same time of telling people who want these worlds to connect uh, that it's not connected. Uh, that's my takeaway from this. You guys may interpret it differently, but I think this tells you without a shadow of a doubt that these are this is another world. And whether Tom Holland shows up as a cameo or something, as an alternate universe version of Peter Parker who isn't a Spider-Man or something, I don't know. But, uh, you know, whether he shows up or not is irrelevant at this point because this shows that it's not connected to the Marvel Universe, at least to me. Um, so next, the shot uh, 10, we have uh, the start of the Eddie Brock scene on the motorcycle. This might just be an establishing one where it's like he's not being chased yet, or maybe he hasn't noticed he's being chased yet. I don't know, uh, but it's uh, someone riding a motorcycle. Does It kind of looks like him, uh, but uh, he's dressed a little differently from the scene where he's being chased. So I'm thinking it might be an earlier shot, and I think that's someone on the back of the motorcycle with them, so it might be Anne, and this might be them going to the restaurant. Uh, so then here you have the restaurant scene, and uh, you have them, it's a pretty nice restaurant, <laughs> definitely uh, something I couldn't afford to go to, so, you know, Anne, she's a lawyer, she makes a lot of money, I'm sure, uh, and it de depending on what kind of journalist he, he is, or how successful he is, uh, it'd, be in it'd be interesting to see, like, kind of their, I guess, like, their statuses in life, because I don't, I know they're not married in the movie, because you see Eddie's apartment, and it's clearly a bachelor pad, um, but it'd be interesting to see, maybe, are they dating in this movie, have they been dating are they former lovers are they formally married and they're now you know through circumstances with their with their careers have kind of found each other again it'd be interesting to know I, I we can't really tell too much from here we can just tell that eddie seems a little protective of her he's a little bit white knighting the situation by saying like hey your boss is evil he just comes out and says it he's not even being subtle he's just like yeah your boss is evil i've been digging into him and he's evil and she's like look my firm works for him i don't so uh, that's kind of neat because that's kind of something that happened in the comics when the that guy who created the Carnage video game and had to defend, you know, her firm had to defend that guy in court uh, to try to prove him innocent. And the Sin Eater showed up and that's how she got involved with the Sin Eater and eventually became She Venom because she got wounded in that interaction. So showing again that, yeah, I'm not, sometimes my firm isn't on the side of angels. But we, you know, we do what we can. But, you know, you got that interview tomorrow. I don't know if she helped him get that interview or what. Uh, but she's like, are you going to behave? And he's like, yeah, I'm going to do my job. So you can see that he's a little reckless with his life. Because if that's what this tells me, is that he has someone he's either interested in or used to be interested in or still close with. And uh, by pushing at this interview that he's going to go do, it it puts her in 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 the targets, you know, of, of any enemies he might make. And you can see he's kind of flipping about it. He's not He's not really thinking about the weight of his decision, uh, as you'll see coming up, because he's a little cocky. Uh, then we get a quick shot here of the underground facility of the Life Foundation. Looks very Resident Evil to me. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe some of these sets uh, were borrowed or used or, or recycled or something, or just, you know, decided to go with that coincidentally, but it looks very Resident Evil to me. Um, and you got a shot of Riz Ahmed here in, uh, in image 14 uh, with other doctors behind him. None that I really recognize, so we'll just move on. There is a security guy there, it looks like. He's got uh, the Life Foundation patch on his arm, kneeling down in front of the camera there. Uh, then you have a shot of Riz here with the trucks are coming in, uh, presumably dropping off either Eddie, maybe they caught him at this point, or, they, um, or they're dropping off the symbiotes, you know, from the beginning of the story. But that's a pretty heavy-duty vehicle um, for transporting, like, you know, uh, you know a, a possible biohazard thing. I would say that's probably a prisoner transport. Uh, then again, establishing shot, San Francisco. So you guys know it's set in San Francisco. Uh, which is where Lethal Protector was set, uh, the storyline. Then we got a shot of Eddie here in image 17, where he's getting out of a, a car, I think, and he's got his jacket. It looks like he might be going to the Life Foundation uh, meeting because it looks like he has the blue collar shirt on underneath there. And then, boom, here's the shot with him and Riz Ahmed, and he's wearing that blue collar shirt. So he's doing the interview here. And you can see he's, he's really cutting in with the questions. He's starting to you know, piss off Riz Ahmed a little bit. He's got a one-on-one -on -one interview, so he's clearly working his way up, uh, you know, in the journalist world, uh, and whether he's doing it, you know, doing it altruistically or whether he's doing it, you know, without cutting corners. We don't know. We don't really know what kind of guy he is yet, if he's opportunistic. Uh, we don't really know, but it seems like he's altruistic. He, it sounds like from the dialogue in the trailer that he 
it believes he's doing the right thing and he believes by exposing these people he's going to do the it's going to you know the ramifications are going to be good ramifications uh so it'll be it's interesting to see that uh them play that up more but i think that'll probably play better with an audience uh you know than the version from the comic sometimes where he's really not likable sometimes i like that personally i think that makes him more human but i understand for a movie audience you want people to kind of like him a little bit more and be on his side which totally makes sense to me um so here you see Eddie with his film crew uh, and, and Riz Ahmed, and then actually we get this shot here. And so this is the woman who was I thought was listed as Collins to begin with, and then her IMDb now says producer. And it makes sense because it looks like she's the field producer of this segment that they're doing. And then we got the cameraman there as well. And I couldn't see his face too well, so I couldn't really see if he was on the IMDb page. Uh, but that's cool. Her name is uh, Ariadne Joseph, I believe is how you say her name. Hopefully I'm not butchering that. Uh, she's a lovely lady, and uh, so it's cool to get a shot of her in this trailer. And then we have Riz Ahmed here kind of looking at Eddie going like, all right, you're pushing you're pushing me, man. I see where the sentence is going to end, and you probably don't want to end it there. And then he does, and Riz is like, all right, we're cutting this interview. You're done. And then he even says, Eddie, Mr. Brock, you're done. And Eddie's kind of like, oh, yeah? Is that a threat? You know, he's kind of not not accepting the gravity of the situation he's putting that camera crew he's putting them in danger he's putting Anne in danger if they find out he's uh, that they're close you know you could see he's a, he's a little bit reckless so that does make him at least have character flaws which is a good thing and in keeping with the character so i'm glad they're doing that uh and then you have him walking through the streets here in san francisco uh that's clearly san francisco to me it looks like uh, i don't know it could be atlanta but uh that some of that lighting there in the background unless they added it uh looks like um looks like san francisco same here with this shot uh where we've seen in the first trailer with you know good good shot with the back lighting of the blue uh blue building there with the blue lights coming out so then he goes into this like little corner store um and he's uh you know walking around and he notices he's being followed so it's clear in that last shot when he's looking over his shoulder he's like okay someone's following me so he, he leads the person in here and reveals that it's jenny slate uh who we heard that her possible name or character name is dora skirth that has not been a, you know like confirmed by anyone yet obviously uh, but she admits here she works for the life foundation and that she's possibly going to be his way in she's like hey look i you know maybe she saw what he did in in the lobby earlier maybe he she's a plant from uh from riz ahmed maybe she's evil but she's playing the you know like the the mousy girl um and she's actually like doing you know everything riz ahmed tells her to do and she's going to you know eddie brock saying like hey you know like uh um, I, I need your help. You know, I, I want to get you to the Life Foundation. And maybe she's just doing it to lure him there because they know something bad could happen. He, he could either get shot by a guard, he could end up with test subjects, they might eat him or whatever. Um, maybe that's their way of trying to, like, you know, sweep him under the rug before destroying his life, you know, uh, and stuff. And that to me is where I kind of wonder where this is because that scene there we saw where he's talking to Riz Ahmed and he you know, pushes the boundaries, I thought maybe he was at a press conference and he asked this question in front of a group of people because that's more public shaming. When that goes, when that doesn't go his way, that to me would be more public shaming. So where it's like, hey, remember that guy the other day that asked all those questions and we thought he was like really digging at something and finding something? Well, we're exposing him now. Like, like the Life Foundation you know, found a way to expose Eddie and they dig up some skeletons from his closet and they ruin his life and they make him untrustworthy. And to me, we talked about that way at the beginning of this episode, of this show in general, was the thing I find most relatable about Eddie Brock in today's world is that we have that. There's a lot of people out there who have done bad things in their life and uh, are either trying to do good things or they're maybe they're still doing bad things or whatever but then you have the internet and the world turn on them and uh, and make and vilify them and uh, you know and, and really push it to a really scary level sometimes and uh, sometimes maybe rightfully so I mean I'm not gonna you know get into that debate but I thought that was relatable about Eddie Brock was that he's this guy who maybe try to do the right thing whether he did try purposely or not or maybe he cut corners to try to get you know where he wanted to go faster and then something gets exposed and his life gets ruined and and no one will hire him and no one will talk to him i have a friend who's going through that right now and it's a it's a really scary thing to have your whole life uh you know thrown like that and have everyone vilify you like that and so you know, I thought that was a relatable thing and could be something that would be interesting to translate into a movie nowadays, uh, especially a comic book movie. Uh, it doesn't look like they're going to go that route because that interview was like on the on the DLs, on the low key. He was in the building by himself, one on one with Riz Ahmed and a small crew. So he probably won't get ousted that way, Eddie Brock, but I'm sure his life is not going to be uh, the same after what he goes through here. So 
Again, a couple more shots here of him and uh, Jen Jenny Slate talking in the corner store, and she's saying like, "Hey, come with me. I'm going to show you, you know, where we need to go." Then we have image 30 here that has a, uh, you know, the the product placement. You have like Tropicana back there. Uh, so I, you know, sometimes you wonder in these scenes like, is Sony like, "Hey, can you make this dialogue scene in a corner store so we can put like a Coke?" thing in the background uh, because probably a lot of this movie might not have a ton of product placement because they might be you know like at fancy restaurants that doesn't have logos anywhere or they might be you know um, inside Eddie's apartment and uh, or you know or they might be at the underground facility of the Life Foundation or in the woods as we'll see later on so you never really know when it comes to this kind of stuff but uh, yeah I thought that was funny we got a Sony movie it's got to have product placement all right, so image 31 here, we have the Life Foundation facility, I think, in the side of a mountain off the bridge there. Looks really, really awesome. Good. Really, really awesome, actually. Um, so, yeah, so they have, you know, facility that literally goes inside the side of a mountain. So who knows what kind of secrets that they're hiding in there. But I thought that was a cool shot, actually, that one there. Um, so then here, this is actually interesting because I, I kind of recognize this guy. And so I had to stare at him for a second, and then I had to go pick up his, IM, uh, not his IMDb, but his Instagram page. Uh, this actor actually follows us but I'll, I'll say that in one second. Right here, we have a symbiote coming out of a jar, and we have a guy standing in the background, and Riz Ahmed's on the other side of the glass. So this is, you know, Riz Ahmed going like, all right, I want to see what these things do one-on-one -on -one with a person. And I can't tell if this guy's a lab tech or not. He's got a white sh a shirt on, but I don't know if it's a button-down or if it's a full lab coat. And maybe Riz Ahmed's just like, hey, look, I'm sacrificing one of my own scientists, which I, I like and don't like when villains do that, when they're just like, oh, I'll kill one of my own, because it makes you wonder why the others would, you know, still stay there rationally, um, maybe out of fear they do, but uh, it, it's still, it, it's a gray area for me. Um, but if this is just like a random dude, that would make sense. And plus, this actor is listed as just Isaac on the IMDb. And uh, this is Jared Bankins. And Jared Bankins is actually, I would consider a friend of the show because he's actually follows me on Instagram and he's he watches the show and he's subscribed to this channel. So uh, if you're watching Jared, hey man, glad to see you in the trailer here. Glad to get a glimpse of who you might be in this movie and to see that maybe you merge with a symbiote. I'm guessing the symbiote doesn't eat him. Uh, maybe it merges with him. So maybe Isaac is going to be one of the five symbiotes uh, in this movie. So that's pretty cool. And then I got a, a better shot here, a more clearer shot where you see like a, a blue symbiote with like yellow strands. So it almost looks a little like scream, kind of the design. But I imagine that they're not going to want each symbiote to be one flat color for the most part. Um, maybe outside of Venom just being black mostly, but he might even have some white tendrils through him eventually. I know we didn't see any in this trailer, but maybe they'll add some kind of white to break up some of the black. They certainly do in the eyes, obviously. Um, so, so it makes me wonder what other kind of designs we'll see for any other symbiotes that we might get in this movie, and how many we'll get, I don't know. So this is interesting. That's a good shot, though, there. And uh, Jared, uh, you can, I, that's definitely him now. Uh, and then here's him again, uh, you know, up against the glass and probably the symbiote merging with him. So uh, then you have, you know, Riz Ahmed kind of smiling, like, yeah, smirking. Uh, yeah, all right, cool. Now we get to see what this thing does uh, with a person. And then you see Chope back there, and she's kind of smiling too. So these, all these people are just plain evil. <laughs> they may be a branch uh, that split off from the Umbrella Corporation, uh, possibly. Uh, so then we have here, we have... Uh, possibly Dora Skirth. We have Jenny Slate leading Tom Hardy into a secret entrance using her key card or whatever to get him into the Life Foundation. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. And then uh, we go here underground and we're in their facility and now they're doing a different kind of test. I'm guessing maybe the symbiote's already bonded with this person and they're trying to see what hurts it. Maybe lights, uh, sound, fire, I don't know. Uh, I can't really tell too much from this scene. Uh, but if they already sacrificed another person without strapping them down to one of the symbiotes, I doubt they would maybe strap down this one unless they found a way to communicate with the symbiotes and you know make it an easier transition, but they need the person to be strapped down. But this actor here, uh, I actually found him on IMDb as well, Martin Batts Bradford. I believe that's who this is. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so there's a, a shot of Martin there uh, to give him a shout out. Uh, awesome shot there. I like uh, the cinema photography in some of these scenes looks really good Matthew Libatique we did a whole video on him he's a cinematographer of this movie he's worked on you know the some of the Iron Man movies with John Favreau he's worked on a lot of stuff with um like what was it uh, uh Darren Aronofsky you know stuff like that so uh pretty pretty awesome stuff uh and then uh let's see here we have uh Subject Brock in image 39 we have Subject Brock so this looks like they're 
They have Eddie Brock in there. He's either in a chair or he's standing up or he's in the MRI. I can't really tell. The MRI scene, I'm not sure if this is it because um, in the MRI, there's no guards around him. I feel like if they knew he was infected with the symbiote, there would be guards around him aiming guns at him while he was in the MRI. But we saw in the, the last trailer when he's in the MRI, there's just like two scientists outside the room and he's he's not on watch or anything like that. So to me, I'm wondering if, if this is that, like if he's actually... Um, you know, uh, if this is the MRI scene, because it looks like he could be laying down in that one shot, but I don't know, he also could be sitting and then just like, you know, getting straight, uh, and they could be hitting him with, because there says frequency here, so it looks like they could be hitting him with sound waves and stuff, seeing the limitations of the suit. This could be where later on we'll see Eddie Brock and Riz Ahmed. Eddie Brock sitting in a chair, and he's being threatened by Riz Ahmed, and he's like, you know, spitting back at him, uh, you know, so he's like, you should be very afraid of me or something. So this could be that scene for all I know. But it's, yeah, some definitely creative editing in this uh, trailer to make scenes look like they fit together when they actually don't. All right, so sorry, yeah, this has taken so long. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, I just wanted to be as in-depth as possible and make a nice long video for you guys since I'll probably take the rest of the day off after I post this. Uh, so, yeah, I got a long day at work tomorrow. So best to do this best to do this right so we only have to do it once um so here we got a hallway shot uh of the life foundation that sign back there is like a kind of like one of those map things we saw it, it kind of looks similar to the thing that i posted the, like the behind the scenes uh footage uh, not the footage but actually like pictures that uh, i think jeremy uh, Bergainier, i think on twitter he posted some images he like worked in the building that they were filming life foundation at uh and scenes at and he took pictures of some things so it looks like one of those you know like um uh, areas where you can go and check, see what floor you're on and where you got to go and, and things like that. So that's what Eddie Brock looks like. He's walking past there uh, down the hallway and it does look very Resident Evil-ish. Uh, Res Resident Evil -ish. It reminds me a lot of that. I know I make that comparison a lot, but it's it just it's right there for me. Um, so here we have a shot of a inmate or a test subject or something. Her room looks frozen, maybe. Uh, looks like there's ice on the walls. And again, probably testing the limits of her symbiote. Uh, her room is colored, a certain color, and uh, I don't even know if she's the same woman we're going to see here in a second or not. I don't know if this is two different women. I mentioned in my reaction video, I thought Im immediately I thought of Donna Diego. She's got long brown hair, kind of looks a little bit like Michelle Lee, um, but maybe not because it's hard to tell from this angle. Uh, so, so yeah, there's that. And then um, this next shot has the woman looking up, and her facial features, they it's interesting because I, I I really was looking at these and trying to study these and her to me even though you can't see her face that well it doesn't really match the next face we're gonna see because I'm pretty sure I know who the next face is that we're gonna see um, but uh, so this one I don't know I think maybe Eddie comes into a room and maybe he sees a couple container rooms like you know cylinder rooms like this and he's like all right this one's being frozen right now and maybe another one's like under heat lamps or something uh, and freaking out and maybe there's another one that's like in a room where there's like a lot of sound or something uh, I don't no, I mean obviously we don't get any of that here in this trailer I'm just speculating but uh, so I, I don't know who this actress is uh, she's she's got a very skinny frame and it's hard to tell from this image in my opinion but this next shot right here is the woman who breaks through the glass it seems or at least the way it's shot uh, she's in a red room so uh, you know I'm assuming it's her breaking through the glass and the alarms going off because we do see that in the next uh, couple shots I think uh, but she's coming right at the camera and she's got her hands out and she's screaming and she uh, someone jumps through a glass at, like a test subject and infects Eddie Brock that's it looks like we're, what we see coming up but when I looked at this image I really really stared at it and there is an actress that I said was in this movie that no, you know, other news sources or no one's picked up on. Everyone focused on my Jack the Bartender video. And the very next video I made after that was about an actress named Melora Walters, who I'm actually a fan of. And uh, I saw on IMDb that she is not listed as an actress in this movie, but she has a stunt double that listed herself as her stunt double. Uh, so... It made me start wondering because yeah, you know, sometimes IMDb gets stuff wrong, sure. But if you're a stunt person and you're a specific stunt person to a certain actor, typically you'll list that on your your resume and you'll put it up on IMDb because it's not a big deal and you want to get more stunt work, obviously, because you have to work all the time as a stunt person and you have to go movie to movie to movie a lot, like much like actors can do that too. But actors sometimes sometimes can take time off. Stunt people usually go right, you know, project after project after project. Um, and so it made me wonder, why would Melora Walters need a stunt double? Well, maybe because she has to jump through a window and tackle Tom Hardy. So uh, Melora Walters, uh, 
I think, is this character. Uh, looks a lot like her. I have the side-by-side -side images up, so maybe you guys can you know, tell me I'm crazy if, if it's not the case. I think it's her. It looks a little bit like her, uh, but I could be wrong. I'm not very good with faces too sometimes, but side-by-side -side, it seemed like it could be a good guess. And uh, the thing with Melora is that... Um, you know, or this character is that she infects Eddie Brock. So Eddie Brock doesn't just get a symbiote without it being passed on to him. And I think that's going to be important for a story point. Like if I was writing this script, I would be like, all right, why, why doesn't a suit go right to Eddie? Why is it coming from a patient in, in the lab? Um, assuming that's what happens. For all we know, she tackles him, he gets away and then trips and falls into a room and runs into his symbiote there. But I'm thinking maybe his symbiote has already been attached to this woman and maybe when it transfers to him, he gets a little bit of her memories in it. So he kind of, it's easy way to get exposition uh, for the suit to go, all right, here's what they were doing to me. Um, and here's what I can tell you that they want, like the Life Foundation wants. Um, and again, it also isolates her. It makes her symbiote maybe unique. Maybe that symbiote bonded with a human instantly and the other ones are having trouble doing it. And again, that ties into the comics because the in Planet of the Symbiotes, they mentioned that Eddie's suit is different than the other symbiotes. It is something that doesn't particularly want to drain completely its host. The other symbiotes were bonding to living creatures and draining them completely of fluids and everything they need, vitamins and everything, and feeding off them, and then it would discard the bodies and move on to their next host. And Eddie's suit didn't want to do that, and that's why it was exiled to Battle World in the comics where Spider-Man found it. So again, it could be a reason why they isolate it here and put it in a separate room, and maybe it's attached to, uh, you know, someone like Melora Walters, which that'd be interesting because I thought maybe she'd be like a board member or something, but we saw a lot of science scientists and people hanging out with Riz Ahmed, and I didn't see her in any of those shots. So it makes me wonder, because she's a great actress, so that would be a, a good moment maybe for her. You want a good actress to carry that moment of, you know, passing the torch in a way or passing on information or, you know, maybe she only has like two scenes or in, she, there are very emotional scenes. You want a good actress for that. So... I don't know. My 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 bet right now is on Melora Walters, and here's a shot of you know uh, Eddie Brock being tackled uh, by whoever jumps out at him, whether it's her or another character I don't know. And then again another shot with the red, it, it, the red signals that it's the same character to me, but who knows? But that's clearly an alarm going off. Uh, some a patient broke out, and maybe Eddie Brock now is infected because of that. And then it shows him escaping. Uh, and I don't know if, again, it creative editing, this could be all tied together and as from one sequence, or it could be from different parts of the movie. We don't know. But Eddie is certainly getting away here and uh, running out through a tunnel that could be, you know, from the Life Foundation, I'm going to guess. Uh, so, yeah, and then he goes right back to his apartment. In this scene here, you see him drinking water. And on the next image here, you see him, uh, you know, and, you know, talking on the phone, telling someone he's sick. He's popping pills. He's trying to figure out what's going on with him. And then he drops to the ground, and you see his eyes uh, changing and you see the symbiote moving around inside of his eyes uh, so which is a great shot actually this shot looks really really cool here uh, and then again back in the in the bathroom and he's talking about how he's hearing voices in image 50 here and then uh, after you know he hears the voice of which I thought maybe was a little Keith Davidy but one of you guys in the comments said that could be Tony Todd and that would be really awesome because I love Tony Todd also. He played the Candyman, uh, but him and Keith David. Keith David played Goliath on Gargoyles, and he also, among many other things, uh, but also he was the voice of Spawn on the animated series. Uh, so either one of them would have great voices for the symbiote. And I know a lot of people were kind of, you know, admittedly said they were nitpicking on the voice. I don't know if I had a voice in my head predetermined. So I guess I didn't have any expectations for that. I know a lot of people asked me that question before, but I, like I always say on the show, I try to temper my expectations. So I never really thought about it, to be honest with you. And so when I heard it for the first time, it just sounded cool to me. I was like, oh, crap. Like I, Keith David is talking to me or, or Tony Todd is talking to me. So I don't know. I don't know. Or it could be just Tom Hardy doing another of his weird voices and they did you know mess with it in post or something i have no idea uh but so he hears the voice he jumps back and hits his shower uh and then he's like holding his head in this next image and he's like shut up like you're not real you're not real and then uh, in the next couple images uh, he you know has a knock at his door he goes over and these guards come in and then boom we get a shot here of uh of uh, scott hayes who we all were hoping and kind of thought he might play um cletus cassidy but it doesn't look like that's the case um <laughs> we did hear that he might be playing uh, Roland Trees. And Roland Trees in the comics is the runs the international side of uh, the Life Foundation. So clearly here he's probably being mixed in with characters like 
Orwell Taylor, who was the military side, and he had the, the jury members with him. Uh, so he had trained soldiers around him at all times. Uh, and then uh, also there was a, a guy named Crane who was had a shaved head, and he was kind of like um, Roland Treese's right-hand man who, like, you know, took out the trash, as it were, for Roland Treese if things got out of control. So it looks like he's kind of an amalgam of all those characters uh, because he looks like the muscle. He's coming in, he's like, hey, look, you have something of ours, it's inside you, I need to get it back. And whether he knows what that is or not, I don't know, because when he sees the symbiote later on, he really freaks out. So maybe he knew it was something, maybe he even knew it was alien, but maybe he didn't, he, how could they know that, you know, Eddie Brock and it would bond and create something that maybe none of them had seen in any of the test subjects. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. And again, makes Eddie Brock's suit more unique. Uh, so then we have some guards here who are, you know, aiming their guns at Eddie, and then boom, symbiote time. Um, his suit and his clothes and everything kind of malforms. Uh, it, the CG here, you can tell, is not done. A lot of this is still early stuff. Um, but you get the effect. That's the main goal of this, is to show you the effect. So when you pause these, uh, you know, single images here, you can see it. It doesn't look as fluid as it probably should. But again, you know, it's still kind of early. They're just trying to give you the idea of what they're going for in some of these sequences. And they're, you know, this is pretty neat. So he throws a guy through a window, and then he's like, look, I don't know what's going on, guys. I don't know what's going on. And then he chokes another guy out, throws another guy, throws him into the sink. Uh, and then a guy come, is coming out of the hallway, coming up behind Eddie, and without even turning around, his back shoots a symbiote out and smashes that guy into the door across the hall. And then there's this image right here, which made me wonder if there's a line of dialogue cut out. This is how much I've been thinking about this stuff. If there's a line of dialogue cut out from this moment. Because right there you see this look on his face where he's like, oh, say what? And then he goes, why would we do that? Like, that's the line he says. Why would we do that? Uh, and I'm wondering if the suit... And by the way, his apartment number looks to be either 9404 or 1404. I can't tell. Um, not that that matters. I just noticed it just now. Uh, but what I'm thinking is, is uh, he says, uh, you know, he goes, why would we do that? I'm thinking the suit, and they maybe cut the line because they didn't want it in the trailer because it might be, you know, too intense or something for some audiences. I'm thinking the suit says, all right, they're all dead. Now let's eat their brains. <laughs> you know, like he says in the comics. And Eddie's probably like, what? What? Why would we do that? <laughs> you know? So anyway, that's just my speculation there. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's my speculation. Because that would be kind of funny. It's the suit just like, let's let's eat them now. And Eddie's like, why? Uh, and I think those are Ralph bags in the back, so that's cool. Even though they shot a lot of this in uh, Atlanta, the apartment was uh, in Atlanta, the set. Um, even though it was made to look like San Francisco, they brought uh, you know California grocery store bags over there. So pretty good. Uh, all right, so here he is starting up the motorcycle, driving off the alley. Then you have, I think this is near, this is definitely, I think, San Francisco. I think this is near Chinatown in San Francisco, um, and I think that's one of the locations of the movie, uh, but it looks really cool. I like the shot here. It looks really nice. I got to visit San Francisco when Capcom, uh, the video game company, flew me up there uh, to play the Resident Evil 7 demo uh, before a lot of people got to play it, called the Lantern Demo, and that was really, really cool. And so I took a lot of pictures of San Francisco, and I love that city. Um, so I might have to visit it when this movie comes out, for sure. Um, so yeah, you have Eddie Brock uh, driving down the street, you're being chased by cars, then another cutaway shot, uh, external of uh, the city, and you get to see all of San Francisco in its glory and its beauty. Then you have Eddie Brock here walking down the street, kind of talking to the symbiote, trying to rationalize with it, saying like, hey, look, if, if you're going to kill things, try to kill bad people. Let me aim you at things that you can kill, that I, that I think you can kill. And it makes me wonder, again, what kind of moral compass he has. He's okay with bad people dying. He's certain, probably at this point certainly okay with Riz Ahmed dying. Um, <laughs> and the mercenaries that, mercenaries that are chasing him. Uh, but it, it's interesting, you know, he's he's trying to make a deal with the devil inside of him, in a way. And that's, you know, kind of reminiscent of the comics, too, to an extent. Their relationship is different, obviously. A lot of people were commenting on that, like the suit is like, oh, the, it wouldn't talk like that to Eddie, or it wouldn't do this to Eddie. And it's like, yeah, but that's because in the comics, the suit went to Spider-Man first, uh, you know, and then went to Eddie, and the the motivation was different. They, you know, they both felt rejected. Eddie felt rejected by society, and the symbiotes felt rejected by Peter Parker, and kind of the Clintar race as well. But rejection was kind of a theme with them, and so they acted a certain way to each other because they became codependent around one another. So the movie is obviously their motivation is going to change, and their and the way they interact is going to change because there's no Spider-Man involved, you know. So it's a so it's going to be a different uh, relationship, I guess, than it is to in the, to an extent than it is in the comics. Um, so then here you got a shot of Eddie, and he's looking in a mirror, or he's looking in the glass of a car, and he I think he's seeing the symbiote like you know inside of him 
uh, maybe around moving around his face or something. And then he goes up against the wall. And as you can see, Joel Schumacher uh, did this shot and this shot here because Eddie Brock, they added nipples onto his costume. Uh, so, yep, so that's a that's a Joel Schumacher shot there, and that's a bad joke for me, so enjoy that. Uh, but, yeah, that, I like the shot. The cinematography is great on this angle, though, where the, it's the hand in the foreground, and you kind of get the alley behind him. I think that's him after jumping out of the, the building, which we'll see in a little bit, because we saw a lot of this footage uh, really early on in, on our show. Like, if you go back and watch our early episodes, people were filming in Atlanta of these scenes being shot from their apartment windows and stuff. And we covered all that stuff and we watched them on our, on our show and did reactions to them. And we saw scenes where he was, you know, where he jumped out of the window, landed, I think the symbiote breaks his fall somehow, and then he's conversing with it in the alley and, you know, ends up making this deal. So uh, he gets, you know, pushed up against the wall and the symbiote's like, look, we're going to do whatever the F we want. Uh, is that okay with you pretty much? And he's like, uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, so then we got a, a security guy here. I couldn't find him on IMDb. I was trying to look to match his face. Didn't really see him, but I'm sure he's just, you know, guy playing mercenary or something like that. Uh, probably not a major character. But then you get this shot here, which we theorized about way back when we saw the first video footage of him on the motorcycle. And we saw uh, pulleys and strings lifting him up in the air. We were talking about how the symbiote will probably come to life and push vehicles and stuff away from him and how I thought that was unusual too because I know motorcycles can get kind of hot and I didn't know if they get hot enough to hurt a symbiote. So maybe that's touched upon in the story. Maybe the symbiote's on, on, only on his back and not near his legs because of the heat of a motorcycle. I don't know. I know it's I know motorcycles aren't that hot, uh, but I still wonder if a little bit of heat, you know, would, I don't know the limits sometimes or how they're going to translate the limits of the, you know, weaknesses of the symbiote. But then you get that shot there and then the cars get pushed into parked cars and flip over and, you know, Eddie seemingly gets away for a little while. But then he looks back and I think he gets knocked off the motorcycle um, eventually because he ends up in the final shot, which we'll see here in the trailer uh, momentarily. All right, so we're getting kind of like to the last like 20 pictures or so. So I, I apologize. It was a long trailer. It was like two two minutes and 40 seconds or so. Uh, but so we have, just like in the first trailer, we have uh, Tom Hardy running through the woods. I'm starting to think that this wood scenario is a third act uh, location because it wouldn't make sense for him to get chased too much in the woods at the beginning. But then at the same time, maybe not because the Light Foundation is on the side of that mountain. This could be when he's escaping from them and they're going after him. So it could be that kind of sequence because uh, we do know he ends up falling into some water and that could be how he gets away from them for a while. Um, but uh, also I was thinking about the woods and, and the planet of the symbiotes and how that story ended in the woods where symbiotes were, a couple symbiotes got away from like, you know, being herded, I guess, and they went and found their own hosts and they were using them to bring machinery, different human machinery to this location in the woods and they built, you know, a big archway to teleport more symbiotes to Earth for a full-scale invasion. So every time I see the woods now, I'm starting to think along those lines and wonder if that's going to have anything to do with the movie because the movie is based on Lethal Protector and Planet of the Symbiotes. Um, so that obviously changes a lot of things. I know a lot of people were talking about the the motivations for the Life Foundation being different uh, in the movie. And if you didn't watch my other video, please do because if, if for those out there who are like, hey, the Life Foundation are this kind of group and they you know they're a survivalist group and they they take like ri really rich people who pay them they're building a shelter for them and if the you know during the cold war this was in the comics they were like all right we're if the war goes in if the world goes into like nuclear holocaust you all you one percenters and all you rich people who paid us you're safe you're going to be in a bunker underground and we're going to make symbiotes or the tri-sentinel or you know mutated humans like all these things that carlton drake tried to do before ending up you know with symbiotes uh, to create uh he was trying to you know, design protectors to protect all the rich people that were going to be in hibernation and waiting until the radiation poisoning and all that stuff and the fallout of nuclear war dissipated and then they would come back and repopulate and rebuild the earth the way they seem fit. And that is the, the exact plot of Resident Evil Final Chapter, which is a Sony movie that came out less than two years ago. So I was saying, like, I hope they don't do the, the actual Life Foundation's motivations. I know that sucks because that's who they are in the comics, but to me, I'm like, I hope they change that because literally Sony just made that movie and it was goofy as hell. So, uh, you know, I, you know, I, it didn't work for Resident Evil. Maybe it could have worked for this, but I think by adding in Planet of the Symbiotes, it, it'll help change the story in, in a more organic way that fits right for the movie. And sometimes you got to just accept that, you know, when movies are being translated from things like comics and, and books and things like that. I'm not saying that that makes it right. I still haven't seen the movie yet. I might end up hating it, but I'm just, you know, giving you my rationale right now.
So Eddie Brock's running through the woods. He plows through this uh, tree here, uh, which I didn't get a still shot of, but it doesn't matter. You know what a tree exploding probably looks like. Uh, you can always watch the trailer. I'll put a link down below to the trailer. Uh, then you have this doom buggy that's chasing him in the woods. So again, and I couldn't recognize any of the drivers or, or, or guards there, the mercenaries. Um, so yeah, it looks like they're chasing him in the woods. And again, I don't know when that takes place. Obviously, a lot of creative editing going on here. Uh, then you have these two mercenaries running up the stairs, Eddie Brock jumping out the window, uh, you know, again, falling out of the window. I think the symbiote man breaks his fall, if I remember the stunt stuff uh, working. And then all those people who were saying, oh, he's um, he's going to be Agent Venom in the movie. He's going to have a military background because they saw him wearing that you know, harness. Yeah, that was a harness for like, you know, falling from a great distance and jumping and, and things like that. So uh, way back when we made that video, I debunked that immediately. I was like, he's not Agent Venom. That's a harness for stunts. That is not a harness. That is not a military harness. Uh, there's no pouches on it and it's not the right color. Um, and uh, a lot of people thought I was crazy, but uh, I am, but I wasn't that time. Uh, so here we got a great shot of Michelle Williams, who I am madly in love with, and uh, she's playing Anne Wang, and she's in a room here looking up at something. Maybe she's looking at Eddie. Maybe this is near the room where you know, all the computers fly off the tables. Kind of looks like it's lit the same way, but I don't know for sure because behind her there's still chairs and computer monitors that weren't knocked over, so I don't think it's the same exact room. So I don't know what's going on here, but... That's a good shot. She looks great. Uh, then we have this shot of him in the MRI, different from the first trailer. You see more symbiotes splashing up on him. And one of my critiques of the first trailer was he was screaming at the camera too long because they wanted that symbiote to slowly rise up his neck as he was screaming. And to me, I thought, well, to make it more effective uh, for a sequence, normally I'm not into jump scares and I like when things take time, but him just convulsing and screaming looked a little silly. And I thought, oh, if they make it shorter and have the black ink go up faster, then that would look better. And they did that in this trailer, so I'm all on board for that. That's cool. Uh, here's a shot of all the computers flying off the table again. They look like similar monitors as the ones that were in the background of uh, uh, Anne Wang. So maybe this is before that happens. Maybe she's looking up and she sees something coming towards them and then you know, Eddie lands or, or a sonic thing goes off or something happens and it knocks all the computers off and knocks everyone away. Um, Again, I think it's a weird setup for an office, and normally you wouldn't put tables like that, uh, but, you know, who cares? Nit nitpicky stuff. Um, so then you have Riz Ahmed here questioning Eddie Brock. He has him chained down. Uh, he looks a little bit more, you know, dressed down here. Normally Riz Ahmed's character is always, you know, Dr. Carlton Drake is, is dressed to the nines almost. He's got nice suits on. He's got nice other things. Here he looks a little bit more casual, so it makes me wonder... Uh, the, the the context of the scene, where it happens in the movie, probably towards the end. I'm thinking maybe Riz Ahmed might go through a transformation in this movie. Uh, so maybe he's, you know, I don't know, maybe he's the Jeff Goldblum fly character and maybe he's infected somehow or mutating somehow in a different way and he turns out to be the big bad guy at the end. Uh, there's a lot of things going through my mind about that, but I'm pretty sure I'm wrong about all of them. But I think he's a great actor. So seeing this shot here, it just like looks really intense. I think these two are going to have a great scene together there. I think that's going to be awesome. Uh, so then we got more of the chase sequence in the street. We have Eddie Brock on the motorcycle. This is where he flies off the motorcycle. Uh, he's up in the air. This is kind of a goofy shot. That's why I laughed in the trailer. I was like, oh, it's so, it's so like uh, just over the top and ridiculous. For me, I would have made it more visually interesting. Uh, this looks like a stunt being performed. It doesn't look like uh, something that would, you know, feel a little bit more organic or more real. So if I had him flying up in the air with the motorcycle, I would have the motorcycle maybe spinning a little bit or, or spinning this way or something. And to the point where the suit has to reach out, latch around the motorcycle, pull it in, pull Eddie in close with it, and then right them before they hit the ground and then have the suit like, you know, help him land properly. This looks like a shot from like the Resident Evil 2 movie where, where Alice like kicks up the motorcycle and sends it at the liquor and then shoots it out and has it explode and kill the liquor. Like that was a really goofy and stupid sequence in that movie. And it looked like a stunt like being performed. And I, I like when things look a little bit more organic. The motorcycle wouldn't just go up like that. I mean, it might depending on what angle he hits it at for, for the most part, but there would be a little bit more turning there. And I think that would look cool visually to follow him down to the street and, and him like move with the bike and then have to land it. I think that would just add a little bit more to that sequence. Maybe it's too action-y, maybe that's why they didn't do it, but it's already looks like a giant action sequence in what's supposed to be more of a horror movie. So I don't know, I feel like they could have done it my way too. Um, but yeah, you see the symbiote come out and kind of latch onto the bike and rewrite Eddie, bring him back on the bike safely. And then last, we got this shot here where it's uh, you know him on the ground. This is after he got tasered. Like I said, he got knocked off the, off the motorcycle. You can see one or two pedestrians in the background looking what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, uh, so I don't know if, you know, uh, 
if uh, Roland Treese here or Scott Hayes sees those people, and if he's like, look, I'm not going to kill you here in front of these people, but uh, you know, I'm going to take you back to the Life Foundation. You're going to bring back what you stole. Maybe again, he doesn't know what Eddie stole. And even if he did know what Eddie stole, I doubt he knows it could take this form. So then you have Eddie here transforming, and this sequence is really good. You have the teeth coming around. I love the look on, on his face in the still shot. Uh, you can see the black coming out of his mouth, too, and it's pouring down his face like that. And you see his eyes, and they're just like, they're just dead. Like, his eyes look dead. It's almost like Eddie Brock is is giving in to an, the, the other life form taking over. So Eddie Brock almost is becoming like a, a you know a wax figure or emotionless while this thing comes to life so it's like he's dying while the suit comes to life and it's like i don't know that's what it looks like to me but his eyes just like he's just staring blankly at scott hayes like i i feel bad for what's about to happen to you kind of thing like i hate you you try to kill me but dude you're about to get your brains eaten <laughs> you know uh, but that shot's really cool and then this next shot where the lip is like folding down that's really cool i'm glad i was able to get that still image uh the tongue slowly coming out there uh peeking out this one's great this is another image i saw cleaned up i think uh online so this looks really great with him smiling and you can actually see the cuts and the smile going all the way up to like the back of his uh temples that looks really gnarly and then you can see a little bit more clear of this with this coloring the suit and how it looks and how it's like kind of wet and kind of looks swampy a little bit there's some veins in it uh, but this shot is super cool I, i'm digging the look like i i know some people are not really digging it and that's totally fine yeah it's movies are never going to please everybody and it's just we can't we can't let it get to that level where you just obsess over the bad or over the good or if you if you like this you obsess over the people who hate it and if you hate it you obsess over the people who like it it's like it doesn't it's just a movie the, the stakes couldn't be lower like if you don't like it you don't like it it's cool like there are movies i like i didn't go see the new amy schumer movie i don't care it didn't look good to me uh that doesn't make me a bad person <laughs> so it's like just just it's okay it's all right if you don't like it we can still be friends it's totally cool um so yeah, but I like that shot. I think it looks really wicked. And then you have Scott Hayes here shitting his pants. <laughs> like, no, no way around it. He's 100% dropping a deuce right now in his pants. Because that's what I would be doing if a 5'8 man or 5'10 man who I was face-to-face -face with turned into like a 7-foot creature uh, with a long tongue and teeth, you know, like more teeth than uh, than than cars that are on that street. So yeah, I would, I would shit my pants too. Uh, so then there you go. You got the shot right there, the money shot of this trailer where uh, Venom is just, ah, and the tongue's coming out and just looks awesome. I know people talk about the eyes and how like they, they look a little too small. Uh, some people talk about how this looks a little like Spawn and it kind of looks like a 90s, you know, like movie, the way it's lit and the way it's shot and, and things like that. And it's like, yeah, the movie's not done. It's it's still early on. Um, you know, a lot of things got to go through uh, color correcting. There's a lot of things they got to work on for this uh, trailer. I whole, wholeheartedly admit that when I go frame by frame, frame i see a lot of the flaws uh but making movies is not easy and these people need a little bit more time to work on some of this stuff and hey you know what they have more time the movie doesn't come out till october so we're fine uh, I, I'm taking it as it is. And right now, I'm okay with all this stuff. It looks cool. All right, and last, we have this image here where it's uh, I saw it online. It was color corrected, looked a little bit better than mine. Uh, so I wanted to share it with you guys. It looks really awesome. And you see, actually, the eyes are, like, shrinking. Um, it's like, so the eyes are squinting. So you saw in the last image, the eyes were a little bit bigger. Now they're a little bit smaller. And people were commenting about the eyes, how they didn't like them, how they thought they were too small. I'm thinking the eyes change, you know, as the suit changes and as his, uh, you know, expression changes and his emotions change. So there, we might get shots of big eyes, small eyes, little tiny eyes. I don't know. It's probably going to be all over the place. Like I said, I have a theory that he evolves a lot in this movie. He's probably going to have one consistent look for the most part, but I feel like there's going to be some evolution too. And then people are saying like how he doesn't have the white spider on him. In this image here, you can still kind of see veins going up. Like I said, I think there will still be white on him that break up the black because that we saw that other symbiote with blue and yellow kind of going through it. So to me, I think that's going to be kind of the look these things have in the movie is that they're one primary color and then they have another color to break up the monotony of that look. Uh, so yeah, I mean, to me, I know it's not the spider. 
Um, a lot of people want the spider on there, and to it's it, I don't know. It's I want it too, sure, uh, but that doesn't make or break the character to me. For me, uh, it does make or break the look a little bit sometimes to me, for sure. I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, you know, I like I said, I would want the spider, but if it's not there, that's not a huge deal breaker for me as long as the character is spot on or as close as they can get, uh, or I like the character at least. I mean, there's there's a lot of elements to things, and and to me, characters are more than just the symbol on their chest or whatever. It's like, and I, but I know some people are comparing like, oh, well, if he doesn't have the spider, that's like Batman not having the bat on his chest. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's that's a hard argument to, to you know, to debate against, you know, that's a good point. <laughs> uh, all I can say is that's a good point, you know, and so, um, but I, we need to see more. Like, this is a shot that doesn't show the chest fully. For all we know, the spider gets there. Maybe it develops over the course of the movie. There has to be a reason why a spider would go on his chest. That's the big thing. And that's going to be the biggest selling point, is if we want the spider, there needs to be a reason in the movie for the spider. I know everyone's going to go, we'll just make the movie with Spider-Man in it. And it's like, yes, but we don't have that. That's not what's in front of us. Uh, they're making a movie without Spider-Man. So they need to come up with an organic reason for him to put a spider on his chest. And maybe they will in the movie. You know, maybe he collected spiders as a kid or something. Who knows? Uh, but we'll we'll see when we get there. Um, and then we have the shot again with the, the glowy eyes and the teeth. Uh, and then the Venom logo, but this time in like the misty, you know, green and white colors. Um, so yeah. So there's all the shots. Uh, that's my thoughts on this. I know this was a long video, uh, but I wanted to do it right. I wanted to be detailed, and I wanted to give you guys, uh, you know, my best effort uh, for sure. There were some characters we didn't see in the trailer. Obviously, we didn't see Woody Harrelson. We don't know who he's playing. We didn't see Reed Scott. Uh, at least not. I didn't see Reed Scott. Um, Ellen Gerstein. She's supposed to be playing Mrs. Manfredi, which is a link to um, Silvermane from the comics, and also possibly a link to Silver Sable and Black Cat, and that might be setting up that movie or something. Thing. I don't know. Uh, Mac Brandt, who plays Jack the bartender. We didn't see that bar, I don't think, in any of the shots. Um, and maybe we didn't see Michelle Lee either, who's po possibly playing Donna Diego. So there was a lot of things we didn't get confirmed in this. Uh, but, you know, Comic-Con's coming up in a couple months, uh, so we could get more there. Uh, who knows? They're definitely, like, you know, spreading this out uh, for sure. But hopefully we get, now that we got a full trailer, hopefully Sony will start getting on, you know, at least a little bit more, uh, you know, get more marketing out there on this movie just a little bit more because we would go like two three weeks without a single thing on this movie hopefully now we can maybe at least go only like one or two weeks without some kind of little announcement or some kind of something i know there was some scenes i had someone told me that they might have shown some extra scenes beyond the trailer at CinemaCon just for the audience. So maybe some of that will come out at some point. Who knows? Uh, but uh, whatever they share, hopefully we get more of it, more official images. Uh, you know, all that stuff would, would be great. But for now, we got a ton here, and I will make more videos coming up. I'm going to make videos on reading your comments to see what you guys think of this trailer and what you guys feel of the movie so far. I'll read as many of, as I, uh, many of those as I can, and we'll probably do that on Wednesday, probably evening, because I have some plans Wednesday morning. Uh, and I'm definitely got to go get Venomized number four and do a review of that for you guys. So I have a busy day Wednesday and I'm going to go see a friend of mine uh, I talked about earlier who's going through a tough time in his life and I would like to go visit him and, and talk to him. Uh, so a lot going on, but I'm going to try to, you know, keep up with you guys. And I'm also writing my book, so I got I got to make time for that this coming upcoming weekend. Uh, so I'll, I might cut back on the videos after we hit episode 150. We're going to definitely die down. I might take like a couple days off or maybe even a week off of just Venom vlogs and just upload other stuff like Seven Dust videos, Spawn, The Crow. Uh, take some time off so I can work on a new intro and, you know, new things like that and get this uh, season two of this show up and running as soon as I possibly can. So uh, thank you guys, as always, for the support. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and let me know what you think of all this down in the comments below. Did I miss anything? If so, let me know. Thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace.